I'll uh, speak to you this morning about amblyopia, and it's probably more than you want to hear. But it'll hopefully there'll be some things that interest you and, uh, uh, and uh, help you out. If you are going to practice a field different than pediatric ophthalmology, such as retina, glaucoma, plastics, and you deal with kids, you really need to have a knowledge of amblyopia, because that's often just going to be what determines our visual outcome when treating with these young kids. Amblyopia is actually pretty common. If you look all over the world for poor vision, not in both eyes, but just one eye, this is probably the most common reason in children and adults. And for the most part, it's treatable. And I think, you know, in, in uh, you know, societies such as ourselves, it's very treatable. And we often get a good visual outcome. Oftentimes, when I travel with healing the children, these kids have deep amblyopias that have never been addressed. Well, you see this child here, and, you know, you may have heard me tell this story before in other talks. You know, this child's checking. Uh, you're checking the vision. They do well with one eye, but they do poor with the other eye. And the mother looks at you and says, well, you know, I think this child has a bad eye. And if you knew this child had amblyopia and you really want to get that mother's attention, you could actually say, well, I'm not sure about an eye. I think she has a bad brain. And that's actually where the defect is in amblyopia, that you have an eye which is really fairly normal. It might have a fractal error, et cetera, but it's capable of good vision. But because of this abnormal visual experience early in life, just doesn't develop good vision, or you don't have good visual acuity in that eye. It's something that has to develop as a child, and is changeable as a child um, with it. The um, Hubel and Weasel won the Nobel Prize for their work on showing that there's actually a neuroanatomic defect that occurs in amblyopia. We know that those things seen in, you say, your right visual field by both your right and left eye end up in the same genicular body, with some of them crossing at the chiasm and some not. And so in the genicular body, we're going to have several layers of cells, some which correspond to the right eye and some which correspond to the left eye. And what Hubel and Weasel did is they took a kitten and they sewed one eyelid shut. And then they sacrificed that kitten and they looked at the genicular body. And here you can take a look at the genicular body. If you look at the cell layers, like right here, which have to do with the eye that was left open, you can see there are lots of cells. If you look at the cell layer which is um, related to the eye that uh, was so shut, you can see there are very few cells. And so you actually get a neuroanatomic defect. They then did a second study where they sewed one eyelid shut for six weeks. They opened it up, so the other eyelid shut for six weeks. And what they found was all the cell layers equal. They then did a third study, which they described, which they thought was going to be a useless study. They sewed both eyelids shut for six weeks. What do you think they found? All cell layers atrophied? No, they actually found normal. The cell layers were normal. And so it's really some kind of inhibition occurs. Now, we do get amblyopia when both um, eyes are occluded, but it's probably a different type of amblyopia than we get when just one eye is affected. And we can see that when we, if we look at something such as a, a functional MRI, that there's different brain activity when you use it, and if an adult uses their amblyopic versus their... Um, or a dominant eye. In this case, with the dominant eye, you can see the cortex lighting up when they look at something. When they look at something with the amblyopic eye, very little representation. And so you can see you're getting very little input on the occipital cortex from your amblyopic eye. What causes it? Well, these are the two major causes. Anismotropia, difference in focus between the two eyes, and strabismus. They probably each cause close to 40%, and with occlusion being, you know, the next most common cause. For anismotropia, on average, it takes about one and a half diopters of difference between the two eyes to cause amblyopia. Some types of anismotropia are worse than others. Farsightedness that's significantly greater in one eye than the other eye is more likely to cause it than nearsightedness. So if we have somebody who's plus five and plus four, that plus five is more likely to develop amblyopia. If we have somebody who's minus one and minus three, that minus three eye may not develop amblyopia because there's some point that they can use that minus three eye. It'll be the preferred eye. And so they're still going to get some input into that eye. Oblique astigmatism. Astigmatism that's at 60 degrees versus 90 or 180 is more likely to cause it. And these things people have been questioned about on the uh, boards. Overall, in causing amblyopia, the greater the blur, the deeper the amblyopia. As far as causing it, here we see somebody with a lid that's down. Another tricky question is you might be asked, well, why does this person have amblyopia? Is it occlusion? 
is an asthmatropic. And I can tell you, in kids with ptosis, it's usually anasmotropic amblyopia, the astigmatism induced by the lid rather than the lid itself. As a matter of fact, I think in my uh, training in my career, this is the only child I've actually seen with occlusion amblyopia due to ptosis. And you can see she had, was run over by a car, had her lid reconstructed, and it was reconstructed such that it was blocking the pupil. This is a child who you can see that during the time I saw him would barely open that eye, a little crack. At about four months of age, I performed a sling and didn't see this kid until they were like five years old. I thought this kid was going to have occlusion amblyopia from the ptosis. To my surprise, this kid ended up, when they showed back up to see him around five years of age, with 20-20 vision in both eyes. And I realized this child probably was not developing amblyopia from his lid being low. In hemangiomas, it's the astigmatism being induced. Now, this is in the uh, pre propanol age. We would probably be treating these before they got to the point um, in this era. But um, a number of years ago, we, was to, we would tolerate them and treat the amblyopia that occurs as a result of the induced astigmatism. And these, uh, what these masses would do is they would induce astigmatism in the plus axis of the mass. So here, this is where the at plus axis would be, right along here, probably about 50 or 60 degrees. In cases of ptosis, you get your plus axis at 90 degrees, where the lid's pressing on it. And we can even see it induced by things such as chalasiums if they're large enough. Um, here you can see the dermoid would cause amblyopia by causing an occlusive amblyopia. In these cases, these dermoids on the edge are changing the curve of the cornea and they'll cause a, um, a refractive or anisotropia and result in amblyopia. There's a child with birth trauma. The eye gets open, you can see the cornea is cloudy. Well, this child has multiple decimate breaks. Once the cornea clears, this child ends up with about eight diopters of astigmatism and will end up with a deep amblyopia and we'll need to treat him for that, even though the cornea clears. So, and in this child, it has what's called an anterior polar cataract. We looked at about 60 of them here, and we found about 28% with amblyopia. And that's because oftentimes these eyes end up with greater farsiness and greater astigmatism. As a matter of fact, in the study we did, if you ended up with one doctor or or larger difference between the refractive versus the two eyes, uh, you, were, uh, you were likely to develop amblyopia. And amblyopia recently has been associated with nasolacmal duct obstruction. We said the overall incidence is about 2 to 4 percent. You get a blocked tear duct about 12 percent. And there's even a more recent study up there that looked at the duration. Did you end up with a less incidence of amblyopia that goes away at six months of age versus a year? The answer is no. <coughs> And so if we have a kid with a blocked nasolacmal duct, even if it resolves, we want to check them at three to four years of age to make certain they don't develop amblyopia if they do to treat it. Amblyopic vision is going to have certain characteristics. The characteristic that's going to be most important for us to recognize is this characteristic of crowding phenomenon. And what crowding phenomenon means is that when you have the letters next to each other, they're much harder to read than when you have them isolated. This is from a, one of our old charts at um, Wills when we were writing in charts without forms. And you can see this individual checked the vision. They checked it in the dominant eye, 2025, and I presume with uh, linear letters. And you can see, depending upon how they checked the vision, they got a lot of different visual acuities. First, they checked with isolated pictures. They got 2030. Well, 2025, 2030 doesn't seem like a big difference. Then they checked a full line of pictures. Now, on our slides, the pictures were not placed that close. And so we really don't get true crowding phenomena. So it went down to 2040. When they did a whole line of linear letters, it went down to 2060. So you can see, depending upon how you check the visual acuity in the amblyopic eye, you might get a greater difference between the two eyes. And oftentimes, we'll, we'll say that Amblyopia isn't fully treated until you obtain 2020 with linear letters. If you check visual acuity on somebody with amblyopia, you'll notice they'll be able to get the letters more easily correct on either side of the line, the first letter and the last letter, and they will in between. Um, and they make, you know, they take advantage of this when they do some of the newer testing charts. This is the HOTV game, and you're familiar with this, you know, matching up the letters. We have it up there. It's on the, uh, it's on the, um, visual acuity systems we have up in uh, the pediatric service. And, but this is one the nurses would use as a chart. And you can see what they do is they actually put these little bars here. These are crowding bars. What they can do is they can show them a letter. So they only have one letter they can point to, and they're not being confused by where they are in the line. 
And then next to each letter is a crowding bar, so they can get crowding phenomenon and make it a more sensitive test for picking, am picking up amblyopia. So one of the important features of amblyopia is crowding phenomenon, where it's easier to see the letters one at a time or at the end of either eye than in a line. Another characteristic is in grading acuity, and we'll get to this in a, time, in a little bit. And what it means is when we show you a line set of certain frequencies, that visual acuity is going to be reduced to a lesser extent. So if we're using gradient acuity to measure vision, we're going to underestimate amblyopia. This is an interesting one. Less affected by lowering light. Amblyopic eyes are more dark adapted. This is a neutral density filter. You know, you can make it up by taking exposed x-ray material and cutting several slip pieces so that one overlaps the other so that it increases in density. If you take a normal eye and you run this stick up, you're going to get a certain reduction in visual acuity as you get to denser and denser levels. That visual acuity will be reduced less in an amblyopic eye than it will be in a non-amblyopic eye. Not something we do too often. Accommodation. This is a study that was done probably about 70 years ago that's never been repeated. And what they did in the study is they would take your best visual acuity in your non-amblyopic eye, your normal eye, and your best visual acuity in your amblyopic eye. So say you only see 20-40 in your amblyopic eye and 20-20 in your dominant eye. Then they would take it and say, well, how close can you still read that 20-20 line? Well, people could get closer reading the 20-20 line in the normal eye than the 20-40 line in the amblyopic eye. And so they'd say this amblyopic eye doesn't accommodate well. Some people, based upon that, will tend to give more hyperopia, more of the full correction in eyes with amblyopia. Question or not whether you really think that study um, is accurate and whether or not it's really uh, saying you can you know, accommodate as well in uh, uh, your amblyopic eye, but that's something that's in all the textbooks. No APD. Not sure if this is correct either. They did a study where they uh, took patients with amblyopia. They had people rate them saying, no APD, possible APD, definite APD. Well, a number of the patients with amblyopia got rated as having maybe APDs, and it was always patients with amblyopia in their amblyopic eye. So you may get a mild aphrodisiac pupillary defect, but overall it's something we would not expect you to have an APD with amblyopia. To die, yes? What's grading acuity? Uh, this is a uh, grading acuity I'm going to show you in just a second. When we test amblyopia, we can test monocularly, which is the visual acuity, or binocularly, which we'll talk about the sensory system. Um, there was a resident years ago, Ike, and I remember he came up to me in clinic one time and said, well, this is the visual acuity. The patient had a high refractive error, minus 10, plus whatever, little, you know, had some visual acuity difference between the two eyes. And he said, this is the visual acuity difference. Do you think we ought to patch him? And I said, I don't know. Do you think the patient has amblyopia? And I guess this took him back. He didn't know what I was asking him. I said, well, did you do binocular vision testing? Did you do some sensory testing to determine if he has amblyopia? And he said, no, and he went back to do that. And we'll kind of complete more of the story in a little bit. In monocular, visual, monocular testing, we're talking about visual acuity. The binocular testing, we're going to talk about monofixation. So he went back and did some testing for monofixation. Mon monocular testing, well, the classic is having two lines of difference between the two eyes, meaning you see two lines better on the eye chart. This was the way for the last 50, 60 years. Recently, it's been tested in the PEDIC studies where they found out the uh, variation from visit to visit on a lot of the kids was about one and a half lines. So we see two lines are significant. In kids who can't give us that information, we can see if they have a preference in the patient with strabismus, they want to look with one eye but not the other. You cover one eye, they're happy looking at you. You cover the other eye, they're upset. Something called the induced tropia test and preferential looking, which involves grading acuity. This is the induced tropia test. What happens is, in this case, this patient, we're going to say, has an amblyopic left eye. Well, when we put a prism in front of the eye, we're going to move that image up here. We put it in front of the amblyopic eye, nothing. We put it in front of the uh, eye with the good visual acuity. Both eyes move up towards the apex of the prism. Now, because the prism is about 20 diopters, it's actually moving it on areas outside the macula. So you need a pretty good difference for this patient to switch and use that eye. And that difference is usually, in my experience, about 2060. 
There's another test called base-to-base -base prism test, which I'm not so sure is that useful, but that's another test we can use. This is a grading acuity. What we do is, in some places, they'll either put them in a box, they'll use these boards, and what they do is they have acuities with different spatial relationships on one side than the other, with the idea that the child will look at the one with the acuity, and they actually have a hole in the middle, so you can look and try to be honest and try to assess which side they're looking towards. And based upon these spatial frequencies, you can determine a, a visual acuity, and you can convert that actually to a snow and acuity. <clears throat> tend not to do it here, it's a little bit tedious. Um, they actually did a number of studies where they looked at this and looked at the pediatrics ophthalmology ability to estimate the visual acuity just based upon the ability to follow toys. And, the act and most of those studies felt that the pediatric ophthalmologist ability was better on estimating the visual acuity than the grading acuities. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the sensory system and about how, how Ike was able to go back and determine this patient, whether this patient had amblyopia or not. When we deal with visual acuity, whether it's on a, a, a monocular basis or a, a binocular basis, we have macular vision and extramacular vision. We know if somebody has macular generation, they lose their macular vision, but they gain, but they retain their extramacular vision. So they won't be blind, but they won't see well out of that eye. In binocular vision, we can use our maculas together or have bimacular vision by fixation or we can use their, our, just our peripheries of a retina together. And when we use the peripheries of the retinas together, what we're doing is we're using the macula of one eye, and the peripheries of both eyes, we refer to that as monofixation. And this is an important type of binocular vision understand because it's going to help us make a lot of different diagnoses. So when we have binocular vision, we can have several levels of binocular vision. We can have bifixation, which... Oh, most of you, but maybe not all of you in this room have. The primary ophthalmologist on the staff of Wills who do not have, who were treated for amblyopia as a child or had a comistropia as a child and do not have bifixation. It's, it can be easily lost. Um, and if we have somebody with something like infantile citropia, even operating on them at six months of age, we're unlikely to get. And then you can have monofixation, which we talked about. We use the macula of one eye and the peripheries of both eyes. Or you can be monocular using one eye at a time. Now, this child here has monocular vision. They're using the right eye or the left eye. Now, in your brain, it's use it or lose it. If there are cells in your brain you're not using, they get taken out. If there are cells in your brain you use, more get built up. That's what happens to amblyopia, you're not using the cells... You know, in your genetic body for your left eye, bang, they get taken out. The same thing happens with hearing. People are told that if they're born deaf and they do not get their cochlear implants at a young age, under three, all those cells for hearing would go towards um, vision, smelling, etc. And people know that people who are born blind end up hearing better, smelling better, and perhaps all those cells that would have gone for vision go for hearing etc. Well, if you're not using your eyes together at a young age, all those cells for binocular vision are either going to be taken out of the brain or not be put in the brain. And so we need to get you straight at a young age. And we know we want to get them straight within about a year onset of their eye drifting. And so this child is monocular. If she never has surgery at a young age and presents to us at age 10, we can make her eye straight, but she'll only be able to use her right eye or her left eye. She'll be totally monocular. She won't have monofixation. Not only that, but when we get to it, she won't have suppression or ARC because she doesn't have to suppress an image. She can only use one eye at a time. She can look at you with her left eye, right eye, but not together. Well, we should spend a little bit of time talking about monofixation. That's where you use the macula of one eye and the periphery of both eyes. Because the, the macula is really where we have the high correspondence between our right and left eyes. If we're using our peripheries together, those are larger receptive areas, we can actually tolerate a strabismus up to eight diopters and still use our eyes together. And so you can have a, your eyes can be straight or you can have a deviation up to eight diopters. Later, we're going to talk about abnormal retinal correspondence, normal retinal correspondence, but in this case, they actually have normal retinal correspondence. They haven't changed visual direction of their photoreceptors in the periphery, and they use it together having peripheral fusion. 
The really nice thing about this is it gives us fusional virgin sample tutes. For those of you who don't know what a fusional virgin sample tute is, is if perhaps my eye wants to drift out eight diopters. Well, because I want to look out in the audience or look at that clock and see the same clock with either eye, my brain will pull that eye in that eight diopters, and that's my fusional virgin sample tute pulling that in. So if we have somebody with intermittent exotropia, what's keeping their eye from drifting is their fusional virgin sample tubes. So if in monofixation you have fusional virgin sample tubes, that's great for assist your business surgery, but that's going to help keep your eye aligned, prevent those larger deviations from occurring. Because they don't use both maculas together, they have reduced stereoacuity, so it makes it easy to diagnose. We can diagnose this oftentimes with the, or rule this out, with a stereo test. Amblyopia is common. Actually, about two-thirds of patients with monofixation will have amblyopia. Some patients with monofixation will go back and forth between their eyes and not have amblyopia. All patients with amblyopia will either be monofixators or monocular. So you won't have amblyopia if you're using both maculas together. So all patients who have amblyopia have monofixation. So when we were talking with our Right, and he wasn't sure. I said, well, you have to go back and test for monofixation because unless the patient has monofixation, they do not have amblyopia. Now, one other thing is because you can have a small angle turn and you do have virgin sample tubes, we can have a different tropia than for you. What that means is you might do a cover and cover test and you see a flick of perhaps six diopters. That's your tropia. And then you do an alternate cover test and you see the eyes moving maybe 20 or 25 diopters. That would be our for you. And in patients with monofixation, we can have a small tropia that actually builds up to a larger foria. And the test we usually use to uncover this is called the simultaneous prism cover test. And if we have somebody like this in clinic, we can show it to you. So how did I determine whether this patient had amblyopia? Well, what he did is he looked for this macular schizoma. That's what happens. The macula is turned off in one eye. And basically, we can test for this with a number of different tests one of which is the distance vector graph, which we actually used in clinic. And what happens in the distance vector graph is that we can show a line of letters. We actually have a slide for it, so we use a projector. You put on the vector graphic glasses. There's six letters up there. Two are seen by either eye to help you fuse. Two are seen just by the right eye. Two are seen by the left eye. And what would happen is you would not see those letters that would fall into the scotoma of the eye with the uh, monofixation. So we'd only read four out of the six letters. Stereo is a good test. In order to be able to see 40 seconds, probably get almost anywhere on this bottom line, you need to be a bifixator. Patients with monofixation, while it is possible for them to get a few right on the second line, for the most part, they're going to see the fly maybe get the first three right. 200 seconds, 140 seconds. And so we, oftentimes if we bring this out, we can make the diagnosis fairly quickly. I can recall seeing patients with Dr. Marshall Parks. The patient would come in for opinion. They have 20-40 vision one eye, 20-20 the other. They're being patched. The vision is improving. He would check the vision, 20-40 one eye, 20-20 the other. He would pull out the, we'd pull out the stereo book. The patient gets all the stereo rights, has 40 seconds of stereo. He looks at me. I look at him. Right away, this, we know this patient is a bifixator. doesn't have amblyopia. We just have to refract him better. That's why they didn't get better patching. The worth four light. Well, we, what it does is you have four lights on there, some red, some green, and one white one. The white one can be seen by either side. The green lens will only see the green lights. The red one will only see the red lights. The secret to this test is that similar triangles. If you start six meters away, based upon these similar triangles, we're going to go get a very small image of these four dots on the retina. And it's going to be 1.25 degrees or 2.5 diopters, which is going to fit within an 8 diopter scotoma. So if you start far away, those dots are going to fall into a scotoma if you have monofixation. If you come close, say a third of a meter away, well, you're going to get 6 degrees, which is about 12 diopters, going to fall outside of any scotoma. So how is this test done? Well, we start in the distance. We turn on the lights, and we ask them how many dots they see. And if they see four, well, we know they don't have a scotoma. 
if they have a scotoma, the dots from one side will fall into the scotoma and they may see two or they may see three. And that will indicate that they have a scotoma in one eye. Two if it's the red, three if it's the green because they're actually, I don't know if you can see it here, they're two green and one white light, light so you actually see three. Then what we can do is we can move up, perhaps, you know, uh, about, you know, normal reading distance, 14 inches, or you can get up to close to a third of a meter. And at this point, these dots are actually projecting, are so, you're so close that they're actually projecting outside the scotoma. You can ask them how many dots they see. At this point, they'll see four. And then if you want to, you can actually walk slowly back until then all of a sudden becomes two or three again. And if you did a lot of math, you could actually figure out the exact size of the scotoma. Now, I should say these scotomas only exist under viewing binocularly. The second somebody closes their eye, that scotoma goes away, and they, can, they see with it. There, there, there would be measured none of them if you did a, a visual acuity test one eye at a time. So it just happens with both eyes open. For Other tests you can do, the four doctor base out test. We don't do this because it's hard to see a four doctor shift. What it does is it moves the image four doctors with an eight doctor scotoma. So will that eye with the eight doctor scotoma perceive any movement? No, so it won't make any movement to adjust it. If you take it and put it over an eye that sees um, that that is fixating with its that has that's fixating does not have the schizoma. Well, you're going to see that that image move four doctors, and to avoid double vision, you're going to make a compensatory movement in your eye. And so, really, you make the diagnosis of a schizoma by not seeing a compensatory movement when you place this uh, four doctor prism over. But because kids aren't that don't sit that still, it's hard to see it. Some people actually see the image move and ignore it. You know, it's not something we're done frequently. Bagolini lenses. Think about the world as you don't go through wearing red glasses, green glasses, vectographic glasses. This creates the most lifelike situation. And what it does is when you look through it, it'll create a streak of light from either eye. And this is looking through one of the Bagolini lenses. And you put them at oblique angles such that they'll normally cause an X. And it's, you know, it's, we're, it really is the most lifelike condition because you're seeing all the rest of the world. So if you're going to do a test that's going to look for fusion, et cetera, you know, the best test to always do is the Bagolini lenses because it'll, it'll give you the most lifelike um, conditions. The reason we don't do it is it can be difficult to interpret, especially in a young child. Uh, seeing that small gap, which I'm going to show you, is present in monofixation like this can be very hard for people to tell. And so most times we're not spending the time to educate patients about the Bagolini lenses we're performing. It's easier to perform the uh, uh, red-green test or the, um, or the uh, stereopsis. And so with Ike, when he wants to determine whether or not his patient had amblyopia, what he did is he went in and did the stereoacuity test. And they had a high-grade stereopsis. They had 40 or 50 seconds. He did the worth four light. They were able to fuse the lights in the distance, so he came back to me and reported what he found and said, the patient sees this and this. And I said, well, you know, they're bifixated. Do you think they have amblyopia? He says, no. And then I said, well, do you think we should patch? And he said, no, because the patient didn't have amblyopia. Now, how do we treat amblyopia? Well, this is from the Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group, and you'll hear about them. They've done a lot of studies, and most of their studies have actually centered around amblyopia. Prior to these studies, it was easy to treat amblyopia. What we would do is if they were based upon a refractive error or whatever, we would correct the defect, then we would patch an eye. And most of us were patching full-time, which would be all but one hour a day. And we would patch them one week per year of age. And we use one week per year of age because it's actually possible to cause amblyopia in the eye you're patching. And, if, and that interval for causing amblyopia will be smaller in a child who's younger. So when we treat amblyopia, the clock goes faster the younger they are. And so if we have a one-week-old, if you patch them for three or four weeks, you could cause amblyopia in the eye you're, you're patching. And so we would see that child one week to make sure that's not occurring. If we had an eight-year-old who were patching them full-time, we would see them in eight weeks because that period to cause amblyopia in the other eye and the time it would take to improve would be longer. And when we'd patch them is totally the one or two things happened. Either the vision became equal between the two eyes and for us, full would be with linear letters. Or it stopped improving with three intervals, meaning you got to 2040, next time was 2040, the next time was 2040, we'd give up at that point. And that was an historic point, but that's actually been tested again, and that's accurate. 
And then for some kids, after we stopped patching, the, the vision would regress, and we would do something called maintenance patching. And if you were treating amblyopia 15 years ago, this is all you need to know. Now we have a bunch of pedic studies, and I kind of probably put up four or five slides of all the studies that the pediatric eye disease investigator group did on amblyopia. But I'll just talk about a few of them. And here you can see somebody's patch, and you can tell the kid's wearing a patch, because look, you see he's missing the sunburn right over here with the tan. Here's a child showing you they would put a patch on every day on the calendar they do. Fun with patching. There's actually an excellent review. And I don't say it's excellent because Dr. Gutten wrote it, but it really is very good. If you want to know about the pediatric studies or you have a chance during, during your uh, pediatric uh, rotation, you should read this article, which was put in the Journal of Pediatrics. It's the White Pediatrics Journal. And I'm sure it's available, you know, through your Jeff um, subscription. You can, you can uh, download it. And it was just done, I think, um, last year. And she really goes over the pediatric studies and really does a very good job with it. The most known or really first study was talking about atropine versus patching. People have been using atropine to treat amblyopia for about 60, 70 years. What they did in this study is they randomized patients. Patching six hours a day versus atropine. You can see the um, six-month outcome similar <coughs> to your outcome, more similar, but a lot of people crossed lines. A lot of people were treated with patching, got treated with drops. But you can see both were very effective. And, but one other thing that comes out from the study is the average outcome in treating amblyopia wasn't 2020, it was actually 2032. So oftentimes in treating amblyopia, we do not end up with a 2020 outcome. Uh, you can see the patching did get better a little bit quicker, a little bit better, a little bit less side effects, but ultimately you can get a pretty good outcome in both groups. Um, they looked at different atropine regimens, using it just on weekends versus during the week. Really, weekends did pretty well. More complaints on the weekend group. You actually get used to your atropine, and the light doesn't seem to bother you. You make some adjustments, but when you just use it on weekends, you tend to complain more. And sometimes the parents forget more, but there are different reasons we may choose one way or the other. It can cause difficulties. First, the blurs them in school. About 25% of people in that study had problems with their schoolwork. If you want to, you can get a bifocal for school, or you can try to use it just on weekends. It may not work. It's not as blurring as a patch. You may not be blurring the eye. Sometimes we may get a refraction like this. We give out the glasses. It's not working. Well, the atropine, we can actually take out that hyperopic correction here and make it more effective. I will tell you that in a study where they just randomized patients at the beginning to removing that full plus versus allowing to have some of their hyperopia, it really didn't show that one way is more effective than another. But we do get patients who fail all the time with their plus lens, and we take out the plus lens and then succeed in treating with atropine, and we've, that's known as atropine rescue. Occlusion amblyopia. We said we can actually get amblyopia by blocking an eye. Well, when we have people wear a patch, they don't wear the patch all day long, so it's not that common they develop occlusion amblyopia, and especially if they miss that visit and come back to see you. The problem with atropine is if you blur that eye well enough, there may be no point that that's actually a preferred eye, so they may use that in no time. And so if they keep using that, am that atropine, we are going to end up with, we can cause amblyopia in the eye retreating or occlusion amblyopia. And so we have to watch these patients much more closely. And so in my office, if somebody misses an appointment, they're on atropine, they either have to come in within a week or stop the drop. You can get some toxicity from the atropine. The younger the kid, the smaller the body weight, more likely to occur, maybe more likely to occur in that kid you see with iphema, you're giving atropine three times a day or with a ruptured globe. But they can develop some toxicity, and everybody knows these, hot as a hair, red as a beet, blind as a bat, mad as a hatter. And so it definitely does occur. Other treatments, how about to patch? As I said, when I came out, most people were full-time patchers 25 years ago. Well, two hours versus six hours. By the way they were measuring things, they did end up with similar outcomes. But I'll tell you, the two-hour group did achieve better visual acuities faster. But if they did it for a long enough period of time, I think they would end up with more similar outcomes. Six hours versus full-time really couldn't show a difference. When we treat amblyopia, a couple of things, you know, first is that occlusion is going to be more effective than blurring an eye. So the more, and it's dose-dependent. The more you have them patch, the more you glue the eye, the faster it's going to get better. What about doing your activities? Well, 
If you look at some of those pediatric studies, a lot of them had them doing new activities. But first, the pilot study was done, which showed that doing new activities during the time you're patched, such as a Game Boy, video game, reading, writing, you got better faster. After this, they did a larger study, which actually showed there really was no difference. So it's something we don't do now. But there was a point we were recommending people do these video games, do reading, writing, because we thought it got better quicker. Well, this is something kind of interesting. Well, if you have monofixation and somebody has a refractive error and you give them classes, would we expect that eye with the macular scotoma to get better? After all, it has scotoma. You wouldn't be using that macula, would you? And based upon that, some of our older practitioners who are no longer in practice here used to tell patients only to wear the glasses when they had the patch on, because when the patch wasn't on, after all, they had a scotoma in that eye. Well, some people observed, in my own practice observed, that, you know, if you just gave them glasses, the vision would seem to get better just by wearing the glasses. So it's tested. And patients, just by wearing glasses, their vision will improve. And on average, improve by two lines. And in 25%, improve to a degree you never have to patch them. And this is in patients with monofixation. So it looks like our model of monofixation falls down here. It can't explain this result. Just like having a model of economics may not always explain what happens in the economy, or having a model of the atom doesn't always explain all the reactions we see, this cannot explain what happens when we just give these patients glasses. And that was just 2006. So what, the way they did that study is they would take somebody like this and they would see the refractive error and they would prescribe glasses. And in this case, when they prescribe glasses, they'd take a half a doctor either eye, make this plano, this plus to be 50, plus 50, at 65. And what you can do is you can have them come back with their glasses, put on their glasses, and measure it. And you get something like 28. You send them out. And what they did is they actually would have them come back every five weeks. I would just make an assessment, say six years old, come back in 12 weeks. And they come back and all of a sudden they improve from 2080 to 2050. This is known as refractive adaptation. They've gotten better. If we patch them now, we're going to have to patch them less. And it'll be easier because they have better visual acuity. And I figure 2050 is all we're going to get with the glasses, so let's start patching. So we do patching three hours a day. We get them back. And this is another two months later. And now they're up to 2025. And probably this 2050 to 2025, we only got by having them wear the patch. Or if we used atropine drops. What about age of the patient? Well... The younger the age, the more responsive you are. They broke amblyopia up into severe, moderate, and mild. Age three to five, all groups did well. Five to seven, if you were severe, you started worse than 21, 25, you didn't do as well. Seven to 13, oh, if you're mild, you did well, but the other two groups didn't do as well. Doesn't mean that if you're 10 years old, we shouldn't patch somebody with severe amblyopia, but we only may take them from 2200 to 2050 or 2060, Whereas if we did that in somebody three years old, we might get 2025 or 2020. How old is too old? Well, let's show you the graphs. If you take a look, this is patching and glasses. This is just glasses. You hit about age 12, and you can see that adding patching beyond age 12 really doesn't improve things. So patching becomes less effective when added to the glasses, and by age 12, virtually nobody gets better. And so we'll try up to age 12. Treatments, besides patching, you can do optical blur. This is somebody who is highly nearsighted from the retinopathy from maturity, is amblyopic as well. What we did is they wear like minus 16 lenses. Well, we have one glass that's Plano, and they wear that glass a few days a week to treat their amblyopia. This is somebody who had a variant of Peters. You can see his Peters right over here, measuring it with the millimeter ruler, and there's enough area for him to see around. We couldn't get him to wear a patch, so we put a plus nine contact lens in one eye that he would wear periodically. Some people are more formidable in, which, in the way they treat amblyopia. Up north, you can treat amblyopia a little bit differently. This is Dr. Arnold. He's in Alaska, the Fly Frontier. He would sew patches on. And this is what he did here. This is somebody else for, um, practicing in Toronto, and I want you to note this name. <laughs> what they did is they glued patches on every week. Had a patient here, we couldn't get him to patch in clinic, couldn't get him to use the contact lens, see if, he would pa see if he would do that for us here, but wasn't willing to. But maybe you can find an appropriate patient he'd be willing to do with you. This is kind of interesting. Acupuncture. There are a number of articles supporting acupuncture. 
Another article is trying to refute the studies with acupuncture. There's a lot, you know, there are a lot of articles in the literature about it. I'm not sure what to make of it yet, but it's something we don't do in this area. Can it slide back? Yeah, it can slide back. These are some numbers to remember. When they looked, and this is looking a few months later, 25%, 21%. It also depends upon how you stop the patching. If you wean the, the patching down before you stopped it, down to two, two hours a day, you had less of a recurrence rate than at six to eight hours. Now, these are good numbers to know from the boards, but this may not always be what happens in practice. Some things they didn't look at is based upon the age of the patient. The younger patients are more likely to recur. If you're four years old, you're much more likely to recur than you are at seven or eight. Not only that, but they give you these numbers. Now, I did show you the two-year outcome from the amblyopia patching study. And in that two-year outcome, they had a percentage of patients who required additional patching or additional atropine. What would you guess that number to be? 40%? 14%? The number was 90%. So while we're talking about numbers like this, realize when they looked two years later, some 90% of patients in that study required additional treatment for their amblyopia. So the regression rate can be, recurrence rate can be high, much higher in younger kids, lesser in older kids. And it's something we want to watch for. And if we're patching more than two hours a day, we want to wean it down. Amblyopia can occur in both eyes. This is somebody with sclerocornea. We want to give them clear cornea so they don't develop an amblyopia in both eyes. You can develop something due to high refractive errors called isometropic amblyopia, high astigmatism, high farsightness. We see it all the time. Somebody has plus 350 astigmatism. They're seeing 2080. We put glass on them. They're 2060. We have them come back in three months. They're 2025. We want to treat them earlier. There's some people feel that giving the glasses by age five will improve their outcome and the visual acuity. This is a certain amblyopia syndrome. High myelination, well, I'm sorry, myelination with high nearsightedness and an amblyopia response poorly treatment, known as the triad of Stratzma, an unusual triad. Myelinating nerve fibers and high nearsightedness, and they respond poorly to amblyopia treatment. Um, we see amblyopia with lots of things. Sometimes it can be almost what's overwhelming. This is a kid with trauma who had the old two retina one cornea procedures or this might have been two cornea, one retina, and you can see he's eight fake You put, you know, they get to you three months later, you try them out, they can't see, they can't see when you put the patch on, you let them wear the patch and everything for a little bit, 2025. 20, uh, what Judy Laverts looked a number of years ago at the kids treated with, um, in the, um, from, uh, with trauma, and the one of the most common causes for decreased vision was amblyopia. So when we have organic disease, some of the visual loss will be due to the entity, some of it will be due to the uh, amblyopia. So how do I treat amblyopia in 2013? Well, if a farsight, I'm going to prescribe the glasses, reducing the, uh, the hyperopia up to 1.5, but the same amount on both sides, because you can't focus differently out of one eye and the other eye. I will continue with the glasses so the vision stops improving. Stops improving. Most times, I just send them out for a period of time. And then if the vision is not even with the other eye, then we patch or we begin atropine drops. And then once I achieve the best visual acuity, I'll taper couple things I do is that in young kids, I actually do patch full-time. A lot of these kids, if you patch them four hours a day, they're going to the mother, asking them every hour, when can I take the patch off? If you patch them full-time, a lot of times after day two, they stop complaining and they're around the parents. And if you do, you can go get a very quick improvement. It's this child going from 7 to 200 to 2050 in just three weeks in a three-year-old. Atropine is usually my second choice, but in some patients, it may be my first choice. You have to size them up. I occasionally use optical penalization by either removing the myopic lens or using a contact lens to over plus. Um, and this time of year, you might see this around in Halloween. Um, but this is how, believe it or not, it looks a lot of days in my office. These kids come in costumes. Just wanted to go over one last thing quickly, because they also asked me to talk about sensory adaptations. And I'm going to just give two minutes on suppression. That when we have an eye with strabismus, what will happen is that image will fall on something outside the macula. Is it here? Because this eye that's esotropic will fall on nasal retina, and this has a visual direction, it's going to see that eye, that picture temporally right out here, so you're going to see double. And so the, if you, also what will happen is you'll have an image fall right on the macula, which will be in, not straight ahead, but the macula will see it straight ahead. And so you may either get two things in one place or one thing in two places. Really, we don't see two things in one place, we see one thing in two places, and so what happens is immediately when your eye gets turned, the macula gets turned off, and we don't really have visual confusion. So what stops this child who comes in to see it from seeing double? 
And the answer is suppression. What will happen is, after, over a period of time, that area of the retina that sees the object to regard, in this case the tree, your brain turns off. It only occurs under binocular viewing. It develops an area of suppression. In addition, and we can prove this area of suppression is present. In these cases, we have esotropia. It tends to be a smaller angle, maybe 15, 10 to 15 degrees, larger in somebody who has exotropia. We can take this adult who has a 40 adapted esotropia and start running the prison bar up and say, do you see double, do you see double, do you see double? And all of a sudden, they'll get to the point where they see double. And we know we pushed them outside the suppression consoma. We know this patient at one time had binocular vision. They are now suppressing. And we know if we put their eyes straight, they have a chance for either one or two things. Double vision. This will probably move the image outside the suppression consoma. Or using their eyes together and develop fusion and stereopsis and all those uh, things we like, such as fusional virgence amplitudes. In addition to that object of regard, we have our peripheral retina. And what we say is that the objects in a peripheral retina develop a new visual direction. And this new visual, visual direction to them peripheral double vision is known as anomalous retinal correspondence, ARC. When Dr. Calhoun was here, he didn't believe in ARC. He thought it was something else. But again, it's a model. And much like model fixation, these are the models and the terms you may hear about in testing. Now, one thing about suppression in ARC, it doesn't give you any fusional virgence amplitudes. So if I have suppression in ARC with a strabismus of 20 doctors, and my eye wants to drift another five doctors, there's nothing prevented. It just goes out five doctors. If I have somebody who has an A pattern, strabismus, or a V pattern strabismus, everywhere where they look and the deviation changes, they develop a new pattern of suppression in ARC. So the suppression in ARC is different when they look down below and have a 30 doctor exotropia versus up above when they only have a 10 doctor exotropia. It's that quick, faster than our computers and our cell phones. Um, one test we can use to look for this is the Bagolini lenses. And I'm going to try to jump up here telling you that if you want to learn about the Bagolini lenses and you want to test yourself, well, you can try them out in clinic. But there's actually something right here on this ion text called the Bagolini simulator. You can put up all kinds of angles and see what the Bagolini lenses show you. And so if you really have questions about it, that's the best way to answer. And the best way to look at these sensory tests is actually to kind of go through them when we're in clinic. And so that's all I had to uh, say to you this Halloween morning. Just vote for your Halloween pumpkin. Well, thank you.